Hey everyone, thanks for watching or listening or if you're getting this in the newsletter, I appreciate you taking a look at it. It is August 2024, so we've got some opportunities for last minute travel. Uh, I know some of you are thinking about 2025 travels. Many of us on the calls, we do kind of similar trips each year. Sometimes the dates change slightly. Maybe the pricing unfortunately has to change. So. Some of those fine details um, go through the show notes. They'll also be in the newsletter. Reach out to any of the individuals that you're interested in. And I highly, you know, talk to them, ask questions. If there's something you wanna see that might be a little different, you know, there might not be everything, every tour we can cover today on this particular recording. So I'm gonna start with Elaine. So welcome, Elaine. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Yeah, so tell us again for all of those who haven't met you a little bit about who you are, your your passion for the places you go and what mm -hmm. you wanna share with us today. Sure, thank you. Well, yes, my name is Elaine Dixon. I am the client services manager and uh, sometimes escort for Sahara Adventures. We are a licensed and registered uh, ground transportation company in Morocco. It's the only company or country where we operate. And um, we do a range of um, both custom tours and of course, um, you know, program tours. So uh, tours that anyone can join. These of course are uh, identified and, and outlined on our website, which is www.cometothesahara.com. And we hope everyone does. <laughs> so the um, I wanted to uh, focus on our women's tour, which we will next run in uh, spring of 2025. But for anyone who is making last minute plans and still has, you know, time here this fall, just like to let you know that we do still have spaces on our culinary tour, uh, which is running October 19th to the 28th this year. So um, Morocco is just one of the best places in the world for uh, fabulous food and, you know, cultural experiences that you just couldn't find anywhere else. So if you're interested, please, of course, contact me about that one. As for next spring, uh, we have our Morocco Mosaic Discovery Tour for Women. And men can actually come on this tour too, because it's really not so much for women, but about women. And about the experience that we as Western women have in coming into a, a new culture and discovering what the life and lifestyle is of, of women there. The only thing for men, of course, is that there are a couple of activities that are uh, for women only. And that's mostly because the women that we're visiting there um, can't be in the presence of unrelated men. That's it. Otherwise, this is a fabulous tour. Um, we operate this tour with the expectation that it might be your first or maybe your only time to Morocco, although I bet you want to come back after you come once. <laughs> but in any case, um, because we think that it might be your first and only time, we make sure that you see all of the major uh, historic highlights and um, other attractions that people go to Morocco to see. That does include a trip into the desert. So you get a night in the desert hotel and a camel ride and um, a night in a, a beautiful desert tent camp. Um, so it's a beautiful experience there. Um, you see the major cities, uh, the four imperial cities of Rabat, Meknes, Fez and Marrakesh. And we ensure that you have guided tours in each of those uh, cities as well, so that in the limited time, um, I mean, 14 days may sound like a lot, but once you get into a beautiful country, it's pretty, pretty hard to tear yourself away from one place and go on to the next sometimes. So we make sure that you see all the highlights in those cities and along the way, there's fabulous food. Um, there are some signature highlights that make this uh, a special opportunity to discover the lives of women. So we visit a number of uh, women's cooperatives where women are being trained in um, various things, trade crafts, hospital hospitality work, um, all kinds of things. And so you get to actually meet women um, on their own terms and discover their lives and, and their skills and, uh, and their culture. Um, those are sort of the highlights of that trip. Um, maybe you'd like to ask me some other questions or. Sure. Um, what kind of transportation do you use when you're. 
Right. So um, depending on numbers, and we keep our groups small, so we like to keep this tour to about eight people. In that case, we are operating the, the tour in a minibus or a minivan, I should say. If we have four, we might use a four by four vehicle. Um, but we do keep our groups small. And so uh, eight being the maximum on this trip, uh, we would typically use a minivan. So lots of room and um, lots of room to be comfortable. We do want you to be comfortable, of course. Yeah. That reminds me, of course, to mention where you're staying. So um, we do make sure you're accommodated in beautiful, traditional Moroccan riads. Riads are the traditional um, mansions that have been converted to basically bed and breakfast type hotels, little boutique hotels. Um, there's seldom more than six or eight rooms in each one. So when we have our full group traveling, pretty much we take over the entire building. <laughs> um, there's Because these are old buildings, um, there are no elevators. Most of the rooms are on second or third levels. And so you need to be fairly mobile in order to participate. Um, on the other hand, if you need a ground floor room because your knees just won't take you up the stairs, just let us know and we'll do our best to accommodate you. There is quite a bit of walking on our tours. And so um, although you can pretty much pace yourself on some of these, um, like the walking tours and so on, we do wanna make sure that you understand that the the riads that we choose are located within the medinas which means there's no um, access vehicular access to the doors of these places so you need to be able to walk usually short distances uh, in from the parking lots or the streets into the accommodations yeah thank you thank you elaine that's yeah that that helps answer the question about where we're where you would be staying and getting around and i know you mentioned food but um so are there certain foods that, you know, if someone did have dietary issues, they can communicate that or? Absolutely. Yeah, there's seldom any difficulty in accommodating special diets. So um, we've had people with gluten-free issues travel with us with no problem. And uh, vegetarians, uh, no problem. Mor Morocco is a paradise for anyone who's vegetarian uh, because they grow every possible fruit and vegetable you can imagine. And because it's a small country, then everything is picked when it's ripe and ready to eat. And that's how it arrives on your table. So really, you just get fabulous food wherever you go in Morocco. Yeah, I've seen some of your pictures you post of the salads and the fresh. It just looks so colorful and fresh and tasty. That, that, that sounds really exciting. Heather, did you have a few questions? What's the cost? You can, give us, you can kind of give us a ballpark, Elaine, because I know that varies often, too. But exactly. that's a great question, Heather. Yeah. So um, when we ran the, that trip this year in the spring, the price was uh, 3665 US. Um, we don't think we'll be able to hold that price into 2025 because we know that the accommodations are raising their prices and certainly the cost of gas for our vehicle has gone up as well since we ran that but i don't think it's going to hit four thousand dollars i'm thinking maybe thirty eight thirty nine hundred dollars something like that us is probably where we'll be able to to price it that's okay. actually really good for a 14 day trip i mean yes. that's really I'm, I'm guessing everything is included in this the food and um not everything. So we don't really like to do all-inclusive tours just because um, usually that means meals are all-inclusive. And that means that we have to, uh, you know, estimate uh, prices that are probably unrealistically high for what you'll actually end up spending for food in Morocco. Um, so, for example, you might spend U.S. Eight or ten dollars for for a lunch, but you will get a lot of food for that, and people end up sharing. So again, we'd have to charge that, you know, if we built an all inclusive price, knowing that you wouldn't spend that, and so then the price for the tour would be higher than it really needs to be. The other aspect, of course, is that we want you to feel free to go out and find restaurants and cafes and things that that interest you. And um, we want you to be able to to uh, enjoy the foods that you discover. That's part of the, the joy of going to a new country. Um, however, I will say that the major activities, so the, the walking tours, 
um, vid visits to uh, major historic sites and things like that. Let's say the Hassan II Mosque in um, Casablanca or the Majorel Gardens in uh, Marrakesh. Um, visits to some of the women's cooperatives. So there's a visit to a saffron farm just outside Marrakesh, for example. Those kinds of costs are included. So most things are included, um, but uh, we don't include all meals. I should say that breakfasts are always included because uh, Moroccan riads are operated much like European hotels where breakfast is included. Um, dinner can be available if you want to eat at your Riyadh, but they do need advance notice. So um, we try to listen to our clients and uh, adjust the, the meal selections accordingly. Oh, that sounds fabulous. Did you have any other questions, Darcy or Heather? No, just kind of wondering what type of foods you get. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I, I have much today so i'm getting i hungry oh <laughs> um, yeah, we all like food here so yeah, that's a good question well I, you know i don't want to hog the presentation because i could bring up some pictures of the delectable food um but there would be nothing you would ever find on your plate that's unfamiliar first of all um it is true that moroccans eat a few things that are not common here so i will say let's say um you see more rabbit um something like that. That's about the only meat that I can think of that it would be a bit unfamiliar. But again, that's because Moroccans are um, Muslim and so they don't eat pork. So you won't find pork anymore. So you might find a little bit more variety in some of the cuts of meat. But otherwise, every kind of meat that you're familiar with here, um, you know, chicken, lamb, beef, those things are on every menu, every meal. So nothing surprising there. Again, every fruit and vegetable you can imagine. Um, Morocco is geographically north of the equator, so you actually don't find too many tropical fruits, although they do grow things like um, uh, mangoes and coconuts and bananas there. But most of it is the familiar soft fruits like peaches, apricots, plums, apples, um, dates, of course. Dates mm -hmm. are just fabulous there. Mm -hmm. um, every possible vegetable, uh, you know, potatoes, beets, carrots, beans, all of those familiar things. So the only thing that makes Moroccan food somewhat unique is, first of all, a method of cooking where um, if you think of the word casserole in English, that refers both to the dish and to the vessel that you cook it in, right? So in Morocco, that's called a tagine. Oh. And so it is both the vessel itself that's cooked in and it's, you know, the dish is called that. So you'll look at a menu and there'll be a chicken tagine and a pork, or a beef tagine and, uh, you know, that's what that is. Um, so that means that many of the main course dishes are, are stewed, slow cooked, and they're slow cooked with interesting things like almonds or maybe dates or, you know, so some of the sweet things mixed in with the savory things. And similarly, you might find a dash of cinnamon or something in with a meat dish. So those kinds of things mark Moroccan food as different. Um, but sometimes people th think that when it's called spicy, that it means hot, and it's not. Um, they do have harira, or harissa, I should say, and that is uh, very hot red pepper sauce, but it's typically served on the side. Mm. So it's not common to find hot, spicy food on the menu in Morocco. Oh, that's really good to know. And then language, because, you know, many of our listeners are, um, they're English speaking. Um, do you have someone always with you that can kind of, you know, if you're going into the markets and stuff, you know, you want to communicate with some of the locals, but, you know, learning Moroccan as a whole nother language. So <laughs> well, it is. and I know a few words, even after 10 years doing this, I still only have a few words. So I'm ashamed to say that. But at the same time, it is tricky to learn to learn Arabic. Um, French is the uh, second official language in Morocco. So if you have some French, um, even if you have some Spanish, um, because of course, Morocco uh, has been influenced by both French and Spain over the years. Um, you know, colonization and that kind of thing has meant that there's quite a diversity in, in language there. But uh, French and Arabic are the, the main two. Um, but they are quickly learning that, of course, it's the English language world that's doing most of the traveling. 
And so you find many more people who speak at least some language, some English. The other thing, of course, too, is we provide our services in English. So um, the man who owns our company speaks seven languages, including fluent English. And uh, so all of the European languages, <laughs> which is, you know, again, a real shame for me as a Canadian because I'm supposed to speak good French too and mine is pretty rusty. Um, so in any case, uh, we make sure that you receive service in your language and that uh, you're able to get service at the accommodations and in restaurants also in English, but you always have someone from our company with you on the tour. On this particular women's tour, I, I do escort this particular one, so I'm there as well. And uh, I've, I've been doing this for 10 years, but I've been there 16 times. So um, well, I know my way around and know how to help you out. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you, Elaine. It's really informative. Heather and Darcy, you good? Got any more questions? <laughs> you took my next question about the languages. That's what I was going to ask too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like it'd be a lot of fun. Wait? It sounds like it'd be a lot of fun. Oh, I know. The women's trip sounds fabulous to me. And being out in the desert, I'm sure just this blanket of stars that you must see. and. Oh, yes. It's fabulous. There's nothing like that experience in the desert. So, you know, I just can't recommend it highly enough. And in fact, you know, we had fabulous reviews from uh, this trip back in the spring. So if you look for us as Come to the Sahara on TripAdvisor, you'll find all of our reviews, not only for this women's trip, of course, but for all of our trips. And we, we do have fabulous reviews. Uh, we did receive a Traveler's Choice Award from TripAdvisor this year. So uh, we're very proud of that. And uh, hope that gives everyone confidence to join us and come to the Sahara. Yeah. <laughs> So tell us the website one more time. Yes, www.cometothesaharaaltogether.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Elaine. And one of these times, I have to just pack up and go. So. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, and so just, I guess, a parting note, um, you should uh, mark off April 14th to 17th uh, next spring. That's when that trip will next run. So we'll look forward to having you. Yes, thanks, Elaine. All right, Darcy. My turn. Yep, you're, are you ready? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> but I will anyway. So uh, welcome, uh -huh. Darcy. So tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you're new to Let's Talk Travel and to our travelers, so. Well, hello, my name is Darcy. Um, I am the owner of Get Out of Town Tours. I only do tours in Oregon and Washington. My tours are all at the client's schedule, so. Um, you call me and say, hey, we're going to be in, in the Portland metro area. We want to get out of town. Where should we go? Can you take us on a day trip? So I provide door-to-door, -door, all inclusive day tours and almost fully inclusive multi-day tours, just like Elaine was saying, not all the meals are included because sometimes I will just turn people loose to go peruse the shops in the coastal village we're visiting or something. So then I let them have lunch on their own. Then we meet together for dinner and talk about the adventures of the day. Uh, my tours include history, whale watching, bird watching, um, scenic views, exploring the mountains, exploring the Oregon and Washington coast, wine tours. I create tours. Um, I had a tour last Tuesday, actually. Someone wanted to get his wife out of the house so he could prepare a surprise party for her. <laughs> so he surprised her in the morning with a wine tour. Apparently didn't tell her. <laughs> she didn't know until her, her best friend showed up. <laughs> so, um, which was a little difficult to put together because the wineries out here are not open on Tuesdays. Oh. So I had to find a couple of them that were open. One of them opened just for us. So oh. that was fun. Um, and uh, there's always, you never quite know what's going to happen on one of my tours sometimes because my tours are created so that we have plenty of time. So if we're driving down a country lane and you say, oh, let's stop here and take a picture. Look at that gorgeous view. We can do that because I've allowed the time to do that. Um, one of my focuses is the Columbia River Gorge. So there's tons of waterfalls, uh, wildflowers, 
the what we call the Hood River uh, Fruit Loop, which is our growing region. It's um, tons of great shots of Mount Hood. I have another one that I call Explore the Mountain, where we go up to Mount Hood. We talk about the Oregon Trail because where we go is the last part of the overland the overland part of the Oregon Trail. And it also happens to be somewhere where I grew up camping. So I grew up camping on the Oregon Trail. And that is what is unique about my tour company. I'm a fourth generation Oregonian. My grandmother's from the central part of the state but couldn't wait to get out of the desert to come to the Western part. <laughs> uh, so, and I, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents growing up. So a lot of times on my tours, as we're wandering around, I will say, oh, wait, I had to tell you this story my grandmother told me or my grandfather told me. <laughs> so there's a lot of a lot of me in my tours. My tour company is just me. I create the tours. I guide the tours. It's all me. Um, so it's a lot of fun. And it's my way of helping people really learn about the real organ in Washington. Uh, from the perspective of someone who's been here her entire life. And um, in case anybody was wondering, I started out as a tour guide at a local museum when I was 19. Uh, I was there for about, oh, about 15 years, I think. Um, so um, I started doing some version of creating and hosting events or tourism when I was 19 years old. So as you can probably see, that was quite some time ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago. So um, that's that's me in a in a nutshell. <laughs> no, I like it. So, what are some of your favorite kind of signature tours that you like to give? Waterfalls and wildflowers. That is one of my favorites because it includes so much great stuff. When we go up to the Columbia River Gorge. Um, I have one I also call Explore the Gorge. So on Explore the Gorge, we talk about geology and the Native Americans, the Ice Age floods, and we stop at all the waterfalls. On waterfalls and wildflowers, we concentrate a little bit more on the plants because in the waterfall area, of course, you have a lot more moisture and a lot more shade, and you're going to have a lot of different types of flowers and plants that grow there. Some of them are just teeny tiny. And then we leave that area and go up onto the bluff, almost the high, it's almost high desert area, not quite, but almost. And there's a whole different array of wildflowers up there. So that's, um, that's one of my favorites. And I call that my signature tour is waterfalls to wildflowers because it's, it really shows two completely different areas and they're all within an hour to two hours of the metro area so, nice. so i can pick you up at whatever wherever you're staying whether it be a bnb &B, an airbnb a hotel and we go have fun spend the day have picnic lunches or restaurant lunches depending on the client every tour is tailored so again i'll go back to tuesday on tuesday uh, my client was a vegetarian and uh, I personally can't have any form of weed or cane sugar. So a lot of times I will have one picnic lunch for the clients and then another one for me because I can't eat any other stuff. <laughs> but this last one was kind of nice because I could eat it all. <laughs> so depending on the, the group of people I tailor it, I have different people I use for my picnics. I, I don't generally put them together myself, but... Sometimes I'll add my own little things like my strawberry kiwi banana salad, which is really good. Nice. Uh, <laughs> they're they're fun. They're they're relaxing, but you're learning something at the same time and really getting a chance to see all the beauty that the Pacific Northwest has to offer. Because we, in case you're not familiar with the Pacific Northwest, here in Oregon and in and in Washington as well, we go from the coastal regions to the valleys to mountains to high desert and then we have eastern Oregon who is all its whole own eco ecosystem itself so we have a huge variety of ecosystems here which um, provides a huge variety of plants and animals and experiences 
for the client, including volcanic regions, including right here in the metro area, there are, um, let's see, in, in the city limits of Portland, there are five volcanoes. <laughs> Three of them are dormant and two of them are extinct. <laughs> and of course we have Mount Hood and Mount Bachelor and Mount Jefferson and all, all of these, as well as in Washington is Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, which you probably have heard of Mount St. Helens, you know, it's a live volcano. That whole area, all those mountains, that mountain chain is part of what is called the Ring of Fire. And that is literally a ring of mountains that goes around the earth and they're all volcanoes. This is a little tidbit. <laughs> no, I, li I like it. I like it. The, the, the one other thing that I do, which I only do the last two weeks of October, and it's the only one that I allow children to go on, and they have to be 10, 10 or up, and that is a ghost walk tour. Because when I worked at the McLaughlin House, all the museums are around there. There's Oregon City is the end of the Oregon Trail. It's also the first U.S. city west of the Rocky Mountain, and there's a lot of old houses there. When I worked at the McLaughlin House, we still worked with all of the different museums. So I knew all the people at all the different museums, and I got all the good stories. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I found a few more uh, as uh, I was doing some research on getting a, an actual walking tour together. So that one is, I, I think that's probably my most popular tour, but I only do it the last two weekends of October because people like to do the fun, the ghost walk thing. Right. I tell ghost stories and we wander around and we have treats and it's a lot of fun. That's so if you're going to be in, if you're going to be in the Oregon, Oregon in October, look me up for a ghost walk tour. Great. Heather, did you have some questions? How much does it cost? Every tour is different because it depends on if there's one person, two people, 10 people. My tour, I, I believe I forgot to say my maximum is 25. I don't do big bus tours. Um, I prefer to keep them at 10 to 15. A lot of times I do minivan tours. So, and it depends on if you're doing um, like the uh, waterfalls to wildflowers is one of the least expensive ones, just because we have a picnic lunch and there's no entrance fees to any of that. But if you're doing a wine tour, it's going to cost a lot more. So say a wine tour for two people this year is about and I say about, because it depends on how many wineries we go to, $250 per person, but that's for two people. But if there's more people, you share the cost of the vehicles. Um, so it, and I, I know people hate when I say that, it depends on the tour, but it really does because I add, the, the thing about my tours, the creating them the way I do and tailoring them to the person, to the group, I can have a two person tour, but I need to get a minivan because one person isn't that mobile or I can just get a little car and people can jump in and out of. So it, everything, I, I don't own my own vehicle on purpose so that I can tailor the tours to my clients. So it's, I mean, a wild guess would be 200 and up for pretty much any tour. And that's the shit may change next year. Exactly. No, that's a good answer, Darcy. And you did, you answered the question too about mobility, people that might, you know, need more time or have, you know, like something that you need more to get them to a location or. Well, and I, uh, here's something else that is probably apropos is I lived with and took care of my grandmother for 14 years. And we went from her having more energy than me to basically doing driving tours. And that's a lot of how I decided to create the tours. That's why, why I, I decided to do that. Um, because I know there's a lot of people with issues and, you know, someone, some people want to run up to the top of the mountains and some of them just want to take a picture and keep going. <laughs> I like that. That's good. <laughs> Did you have any other questions? Well, what type, well, go ahead, Heather. What type of wildlife do you see? 
Um, there, we have a lot of things here, um, a lot of different types of birds, especially in the winter, because we get the tundra birds. So we have snow geese and swans and millions of Canada geese. Um, there's beaver and mink and deer. Um, we have a lot of different type of deer. One of my overnight tours is called Lewis and Clark on the Lower Columbia. It's a history tour, but we go by a white-tailed deer sanctuary. So that is one of our stops. They are a small deer. Um, obviously, they have a white tail. <laughs> That's why they're called a white tail deer. So, um, and of course, wildlife sightings are never guaranteed, even on a birding tour. <laughs> but um, generally, um, we're seeing more and more things like osprey or all over the place. Uh, bald eagles, golden eagles. I even, I've even been seeing golden eagles on this side of the mountains, on the west side, which we did not when I was growing up because of the DDT. But that's a whole, that's a whole, that's a whole story in itself. That's that's part of the birding tours. <laughs> but um, we have bear here. We have cougars here. I don't do outback tours, um, uh, hardcore hiking tours, because I'm not licensed to do those. Um, but we do wander and walk and, and that sort of thing. But uh, I have seen mink right here in the metro area. If you really hmm. for them. It, and I saw beaver. I live in an apartment complex at the bottom of our com complex is a, uh, a creek. And I saw a beaver down there a few months ago. So oh. you, you just never know what you're going to see <laughs> when you're on one of my tours. And, it's, it's, it's going to be a surprise. Elk, we see a lot of elk at the coast. <laughs> so that's what we have here. Elk, beer, elk. Did I just say beer? <laughs> I, I started to say bear and deer and came up with beer. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> uh, beer, elk, bears. We don't see them very often. I've lived in Oregon my entire life, been way out in the middle of bear country, and I've never seen a bear in Oregon. I've seen them every other state around us, but I've never seen one in Oregon. <laughs> well, it sounds like a lot of fun. They, they actually are a lot of fun. It's it's sort of like going on an adventure with a friend that knows knows a friend that knows stuff. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Elaine, did you have a question? Well, I want, how long is a day tour? So eight to five, eight to four, nine to six? Um, nine to, generally nine to six is sometimes longer. It depends on when the person wants to go. I generally, because I have the car for the whole day, sometimes we end up not getting back until late because I just want to make sure I show things to everybody. <laughs> My first, my first ever tour. Um, she wanted to go to the coast, and she'd never seen the coast because she's from Dubai, and uh, actually she's from India, and uh, she wanted to see the ocean. And because it was my first tour, I just really just went all out, and we didn't get back. <laughs> until, but I tend to, I tend to try to keep it to getting picking up around nine and getting back to town between six and seven. If it's a tour where I have to hire a coach with a driver, then it's definitely nine to six. We have to be back. Otherwise they charge a lot for the extra time. And that's just coming out of my pocket. I don't, I don't, I don't charge people extra and say, oh, you used extra time. It's just, I don't do that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a day out for me too. <laughs> no, those are great questions. Yeah, the um the wine tours tend to be um ten ish to five ish because most of the wineries and close at five, so we you know and they a couple of them are open until six. It, depending on what time of year it is, we can stop and take some pictures somewhere, or stop at a wildlife refuge, or do a little walk as well. So it's they're all tailored. It it's, depends on what you want. So if you wanted to come and do a wine tour, but you really liked wetlands, we can do both. Actually, how much, advance, how much in advance does someone need to book? At least a week for a day tour. Um, if I'm really starting to get a lot of tours, it may end up being more for multi-day tours, um, like several months so that I can get it together, get the... Uh, vehicle get all the hotels 
or yurts or wherever we're going to be staying uh, several months. And then I have um, uh, at least everything has to be paid at least two weeks in advance. And I am because I it, because it is just me. Um, I am willing to make payment, let people make payments if someone really, really wants to go, but just can't pay the whole thing. It, yeah, make make payments. I'll I'll do that. <laughs> That's good. And what season would you say for people that were interested in the wildflowers? Is there kind of a time of year that the Wild, wildflowers are? Yeah, the wildflowers would be April through June-ish. And because of the climate change and how things are changing so much in Oregon, um, that can change a little. But um, there's different things blooming at different times, too. So some years I always go up, Free State Park Day is the first weekend in June. So I always go up the gorge and look for flowers. Some years um, things have already bloomed. Some years they haven't bloomed yet. So they're always fun, even if the flowers, not all the showy flowers are there. <laughs> but but um, yeah, May, May and June are probably the best for uh, wildflowers to waterfall tour. Nice. And then birding tours all year round. Actually, winter is a really good time to go birding. I always, uh, my tours are snow, snow melt to snowfall. So if there's no snow and ice, we can go. That's a good, that's a good, uh, good way to look at it. <laughs> and you go rain or shine? Pardon? You go I, rain or shine? I do. I'm an Oregonian. Uh, rain doesn't bother me. <laughs> so, yep, yeah, rain or shine. <laughs> it, rained, it rained like crazy here the other day, and I wanted to go outside, but I was too tired. To, there was also there was also some lightning. Uh, that didn't throw me any, but yeah, I, I tend to go outside and go, yay, rain. <laughs> <laughs> I have webbed feet. <laughs> so, yeah, depending on, you know. The, the some of the clients may not be too thrilled with it but you know we can we can work around it right there's it typically especially if you've been asking about the wildflower tours wildflower tours typically when you get on the other side of the mountain which technically we go around the mountain um it's usually they don't get as much rain as we do oh raining here and not there nice so tell everyone <laughs> I'll let you put your water down. Tell everyone where they can find you, Darcy, what your website is or how they can reach out to you if they want to take a day tour or plan a small multi-day tour, how they might get in touch with you. Reach me on Facebook. It's at Oregon Tour Guide or just look up um, Get Out of Town Tours on Facebook. I don't have a, face, a website right now. I'm kind of deciding if I'm going to do that or not. Okay, so we find you on Facebook. Facebook, yeah, and they my phone number's on there. They can give me a call. They can message me on Facebook. They can um, leave a message on my phone and say, hey, I saw you on Let's Talk Travel, and I want to know more. Sounds good. If you feel comfortable and you want to give out your email, you can go ahead and do that, too. Oh, my email is get out of town tours. All spelled out, get out of town tours with an S at yahoo.com. And can I, should I give my phone number? It's up to you. Yeah. If you're comfortable. You want to call me and uh, ask some questions, it's 503 709 8458. Fabulous. Thank you, Darcy. That's me. Yeah, sounds great. So I'll just talk really quickly. My name is April Bielefeld. Um, I've got the Travel Collective where I showcase all an amazing collection of people that are doing what Darcy and Elaine are doing. Um, but my passion has always been my New England tours. And I fell in love with going back east in the United States to see the fall foliage, which is kind of, again, it's mother nature. Some years are fabulous, some years aren't fabulous, but I always treat it as sharing with you my favorite places. And so I kind of do what I call a fall foliage sampler tour for the most part. It's the best of a, a lighthouse, some covered bridges, you know, sampling maple syrup, 
tasting the locally made cheeses. Um, and then at mix, I always like that mix of some photography, some time for shopping. So it's not hardcore photography, although if I get a group and they are all photographers, we can spend sunrise to after dark just really focusing and taking longer time with that. But for the most part, I tend to do mixed groups. And I make that, I try to make that as clear as possible that I have optional sunrise. We stay close to those sunrise locations. So those that wanna get up with me and go stake that sunrise spot, we'll go out with our cameras or our cell phones. Those work great too. And those that wanna sleep in and enjoy their cozy, warm bed in the bed and breakfast, um, that's great. And then we usually meet back up at, you know, it really depends on our lodgings. If they serve breakfast at eight or nine in the morning, we really work with the innkeeper and have that farm to table breakfast. Most of these places are using things that they've raised really oftentimes on their property or within a small radius of their of their location like they'll tell you where they got the eggs or where they got the cheese or if they're using sausages or some of them are actually doing maple syrup right from their trees on the property or the honey and the beekeeping so for a lot of people that's just really eye-opening but the foods taste i mean that's one i just i can <laughs> taste it right now the maple bacon the syrups all of that good stuff but if you do have dietary issues, um, you know, again, just communicate, let me know. All of these places are more than willing to work with people and, you know, make sure that you have like gluten-free bread or give you an option if it's not eggs or something that's not um, dairy, you know, there's other options. Um, generally, these tours are all about a week long. So we usually start on a Sunday and then end on a Saturday. Um, some people will take both trips back to back. And depending on the week that you sign up to go will might alter the itinerary slightly because again the goal is kind of to follow the fall colors. But again, with the idea of kind of the best of Vermont, the best of New Hampshire and a taste of Maine all in a week so generally each day we there's probably about an hour sometimes two hours. But it's broken up that we're in a shared vehicle. I always like to keep the group small so that we have one vehicle, usually it's some sort of van, you know, a Toyota Sienna, a Mercedes Sprinter van, which has the higher roof. If someone has some mobility issues, we're getting you as close to these scenics as possible. And oftentimes, right where I park the vehicle, if you're not able to walk too far, or you just don't feel like it that day, there's generally a place to sit, a park bench, or, you know, we, again, we work with you to make sure that it's really comfortable. This trip is all about you enjoying and taking away that happy fall autumn experience. So this is just something I've always loved doing. It's a great joy to, you know, really show people the colors that the trees really do get red or orange or yellow and, you know, that crunch that you can hear, but like Darcy and Elaine, well, maybe more so Darcy, the weather can impact things, you know, it's could be raining and we, we have to, we'll still go out in the rain, we might have a rain jacket or I'll plan alternate activities, maybe we'll spend a little more time in some of the local historic spots versus tramping on a trail all day. And again, if some people aren't, most of the walking we do is pretty short distances, a couple miles a day, maybe, and then Oftentimes those trails are optional. I've even done it where some of the shoppers, I drop them off in town, let them shop, give them a designated place to meet me and some of the others back. If some of them want to say, do another little scenic drive or go photograph another barn or a tree or a covered bridge, because there's so much to photograph. I mean, there's so much to see, to train your camera at. So this year the price was, believe I had to do about $4,500 because this is the high, high season in this area. And I'll have to reference the pandemic and the change in the economy in the United States. A lot of these small towns, some of the locally owned bed and breakfasts have closed and resold as private properties. So the number of available rooms has diminished. Um, in fact, I was looking 
we're doing this in August and I was looking for a client the other day for a room in Burlington, Vermont, which has its own airport. Some of the holiday inns, the corporate hotels, the comfort inns, your kind of corporate standard places, over $400 a night. So if that gives you any idea, I'm having to kind of weigh out and fit in a chunk of what you're spending is just to have your own room. Because I really feel after you've spent your day collectively, you really need that time away. And, and maybe it's for me too. I need to kind of regenerate and get my happy and have some quiet downtime. Um, most days end about six o'clock, 6.30 or seven, just because the sun goes down in October in New England at about six o'clock. So we might have our last meal and then head back to the bed and breakfast and then you just have quiet time. Um, if, if you are a person that needs a TV, that's again something you might want to think about if you don't bring your own little tablet and you really need to have, quote, a TV in the room. A lot of the lodgings I like don't have a TV in every single room. They might have a shared room where there's a TV, but honestly, some of them you know, just don't have that. We always have internet access. I don't think I've run into a place where we didn't have that, but you know, that whole TV, it's kind of about unplugging and getting outside and spending time in nature. So that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Did you have... <laughs> whatever, whatever they grow back there. Yeah, exactly. Did you guys have questions? You had me, you had me at maple syrup tasting i know <laughs> i know <laughs> yeah, you can tell i like food i like to sample everything so <laughs> that would actually make a good tour just going down there and going doing a tour for of the maple syrup farms oh yeah you could just do maple syrup apple orchards cheeses you know just i mean and that would take you a full day just in one area because there's so many different places and a lot of people didn't, I know I probably didn't realize my first time in New England, all the different maple syrup grades that mm -hmm. they, you know, depending on when they, they get the sap from the trees and the whole process. So it is really, it's really interesting to see the process, see the trees and realize how much sap from the tree it takes to make a gallon of maple syrup. And, so now when how, you- And how different they taste earlier. Yeah later in the year if you've done um sampling I, I had one that i got from vermont that um the first one tasted like they put vanilla in it but that's just oh. the way out of the tree it was so good <laughs> yes and some of them do do uh at, you know they'll, they'll smoke it they have some other processes they're starting to do too so same with like jams and jellies and so always leave your room, some room in your checked bag if you want to bring anything <laughs> back you know, or take half a suitcase. And that's the yeah. other thing is just, you know, you really don't need a lot of fancy clothes when we go out there in the fall. I mean, I've been in some really nice restaurants and hiking boots are perfectly acceptable. You know, just a nice pair of clean jeans and a sweater. You don't have to get all fancy. That's kind of what I like about going that time of year is you can be comfortable and wear layers. The last few years, it hasn't gotten that cold at night. Um, haven't been seeing the frost in October, which they really, the trees kind of need that cold snap. But honestly, the last few years, some of the days, it's been in the 70s still in October. It can get kind of warm in the sunshine and you're outside. So just mm -hmm. having things that you can take off and layers really helpful. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Questions, Heather? Oh, I'd love to go. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I do. I'm kind of like Darcy. I do. I do all the driving. I do all the routing. I do all of the and that's another service, too. If you don't if you're a person that wants to do it on your own and doesn't want to go in a group tour, I also do personalized itineraries for people. So contact me and tell me what kind of budget, how detailed you want the itinerary. I literally, if you're really into photography and you want those postcard or those images that you can sell or put in a gallery, I've had artists join me that do that. I can literally tell you, these are the places I would suggest to put your tripod, where to be, what time, 
you know, there's a lot of that on photo apps as well, but sometimes getting someone that's actually been there and kind of can give you that preview, like this is what you're going to get, because if you go out and it's dark and you only have that night and maybe another night to spend there, you're on a tight schedule, you kind of kind of helps to have that that information, that background information. And which, what were the states again that you go to on these tours? Um, I do a taste of Maine, um, Vermont and New Hampshire. So I really focus on those, but I have included, um, if I do a later in the month tour, I have done um, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, and a little bit of Massachusetts dipping down into the Northern part of Massachusetts. Or again, if you're doing it on your own, those are states I'm familiar with. I've gone out and scouted those and done those areas, but I really feel like there's so much to see in just those three. Good question. <laughs> All right. Well, if everyone's yeah, Elaine. No, it's fine. <laughs> so my web, yeah, my website again is yourphototravelguide.com. Again, I have a long one. Fall photo trips, self drive, New England, and of course, you can find out more about any of these lovely ladies and some of our other tour providers on the-travelcollective.com. I'll be adding to that website. I did have to recently redo it. So it is a work in progress, but the video channel on YouTube is The Travel Collective and we've got hundreds of videos. We have, have a whole playlist on Let's Talk Travel and I highly encourage people to reach out to the individuals that we have on there. I think we try really hard to vet who we have on this uh, as i personally say i would take any pretty much anyone's tour that i've had on and i really try to keep it that way so so it's something that's important to me so well, thank, thank you you're welcome darcy so your website one more time for everyone um at oregon tour guide or get out of town tours on facebook yep that's right and i'll put that in the show notes too and elaine www.cometothesahara.com. Fabulous. And we thank Heather for being our special guest. So if you want to be a special guest, uh, sign up for the newsletter, follow us on Facebook. We have a pretty active Facebook group and we welcome your participation. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>